Welcome to Where He Leads Me with Mike and Laura Harris. Where He Leads Me will help to bring understanding of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Join Mike and Laura as they discuss biblical truths to help people walk in their God-given purpose and calling. Welcome back to Where He Leads Me. I'm Mike Harris. And I'm Laura Harris. We're very happy to be with you today. Very, very happy. And Laura, I'm excited about our program today, believe it or not. And I want you to tell our (laughs) listeners what we'll be talking about. Okay. I'm so glad you're excited. (laughs) I'm laughing because Mike is always excited about our programs and the things that we're going to be sharing with people. But today... We are going to be talking about the covenants of God. And I know that sounds like something that may not be that interesting, but trust me, this is very interesting and it's very, very important for Christian believers to know and understand the covenants of God and in particular, the covenants that were made with Israel. We believe it's important. I think that this is important because of the framework of understanding why there is importance for Israel to be connected to the church and the church to be connected to Israel. And we are going to talk about five main covenants. There are other covenants in Scripture, but we're going to talk about five main covenants. And every covenant that I'm talking about, about today is a covenant that was made with Israel, including the new covenant, which was ratified by Jesus Christ. It was a covenant that was made with Israel and Judah. We are going to go through these covenants and just let people know why this is so very important. Well, we were grafted in, as we'll see in Scripture, But the covenants were with Israel. Well, that's right, Mike. So let's begin and talk about what is a covenant and why is a covenant important? And so I think one of the things that we're going to see is that covenants are God's relationship with his people. And one of the ways that we can loosely view covenants is to understand it in terms of contractual relationships or contractual agreements, although that is really not a very good example, but it is something that I think modern listeners can hear and understand as a framework for knowing where to begin. Well, and we see it also in the union of a husband and wife in marriage, because they make covenant vows to each other during the ceremony of their marriage. Well, and actually marriage is a covenant relationship between a man, a woman, and God. It's supposed to be a three-way covenant relationship. But Mike, talking about covenants in terms of contractual agreements, although covenants are much more based on relationship than contracts are, but in a covenant... It is the imposition of a liability or an obligation on the part of one or both parties to the other parties to the covenant. Biblical covenants really are divine promises whereby the Lord promises to be bound in an agreement with people by his word. Laura, you want to know the good news? God keeps his covenants and his promises with his people. (laughs) That's right. God is faithful, and we do not doubt that one little bit, do we? No, we do not. We have covenants from God in the scriptures. We can take it to the bank. Primarily, the covenants are found in the Old Testament. Even the New Covenant, which was ratified by Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about that, was introduced in Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-one. The word covenant in Hebrew is berit, and it means primarily a cutting. It's a reference to a custom of cutting or dividing animals in two, and this is like an ancient history, and then laying those pieces of 
the sacrificed animal out on the ground and to form an aisleway in between the pieces of the animal and the party to be bound by the covenant would walk through those pieces of those sacrificed animals as if to say, I acknowledge that if I don't comply with the covenant agreement, I'm saying I know that this is what's going to happen to me. Wow. (laughs) You'd want to keep those covenants for sure. Well, exactly. And we're going to see that God bound himself in a covenant ratification ceremony whereby he passed through the pieces with Abraham. So the superior party, who is God, bound himself to the lesser party, who was Abraham. And that was a little unusual because normally it would be the lesser party passing through. Absolutely. Well, our understanding the covenants is so important because the covenants provide the skeletal framework for how the whole biblical story holds together. Well, Mike, that's right. And in the ancient world, we see that covenants establish the basis of relationship, the conditions of the relationship. And you mentioned marriage. The covenant relationship of marriage establishes how a man and a woman are bound to each other for life based on that covenant commitment to each other and to God. Covenants also establish the promises and conditions of the relationship and the consequences if those conditions are unmet. Laura, why don't you give our listeners an overview of the covenants we'll be talking about both today and in next week's program? Well, Mike, God is a covenant-making God. He's a covenant-keeping God, and He fulfills the covenants that He makes with His people. Oftentimes in Scripture, we see signs associated with the covenants, and we'll talk about those as we get into the specifics of the covenants that we're going to talk about today. But today and next week, we're going to talk about the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, and the new covenant. And those are all promises and agreements by the Lord himself to move people from post-fall with Adam and Eve separating themselves and us from the Lord to the redemption that comes with the new covenant that was ratified by Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, those are some pretty important names in Scripture you just mentioned, Laura, and those covenants made by God with his people are so important. Just to also give a little bit more of the progressive nature of these covenants, we see that who the covenants were made with. All of the covenants were made with Israel except the covenant with Noah, and the covenant with Noah was made with all living creatures. So not only humankind, but in the animal kingdom as well. But when we talk about the covenant with Abraham, It is a covenant with one man. When we talk about the covenant relationship through his line and through Jacob, it's with a family. And when we talk about the covenant with Moses, it's with the nation of Israel. When we talk about the covenant with David, it is a kingdom covenant. And then we talk about the new covenant. It is with all future believers in Jesus Christ, through the blessing of Israel. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the new covenant. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Well, Laura, we see in Genesis 6, 18, and this is God speaking with Noah, and it says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Well, Mike, the covenant with Noah comes about because the Lord saw the depravity on the earth. In Genesis chapter 6, things had gotten so evil and so deplorable that the Lord had decided that he was going to destroy all humankind except one righteous man and his family. 
it was in that understanding that the Lord said, I am going to establish my covenant with you as you go into the ark. And so we look in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, and 9, and we see the covenant relationship that the Lord established with Noah. In Genesis 8, 21 and 8, 22, we see the specifics of the promises that the Lord made with Noah. I'm going to pick up with Genesis 8 at verse 20 and read through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Well, Mike, I love this because this is one of the things that we're going to see in most of these covenants. They're promises by the Lord binding himself to a particular person or group. What the Lord said is, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. He makes a promise. I'm never going to do this again. When we get to Genesis 8, this is post-flood. So Noah and his family have been on this ark for over a year, and I'm sure they are so ready to be beyond this chapter of their lives. And so Noah has built an altar and made sacrifices to the Lord, and the Lord makes promises to Noah. Unsolicited promises, the Lord just said, this is what I'm going to do. I am never going to destroy again as I have done in the past. As we look at Genesis chapter 9, we see more specifics about the covenant that the Lord made with Noah and his descendants. So I know it's a little bit long, but why don't you read Genesis 9, 8 through nine seventeen? Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. There is so much richness to pull out of that passage. I want to just go through and just highlight a couple of things out of what you just read. It says many times through that passage that this is a covenant with God and Noah and his descendants and every living creature. So this is one of the most expansive covenant agreements of God that he is binding himself to say, I'm never going to destroy the earth again by water. This is an agreement that he's made with every living creature, all flesh that is on the earth. Also, one of the things that we see in here in Genesis 9, 12, is that the Lord gave a sign of the covenant. And we often see that in scripture when we're going to talk about these covenants, that the Lord gives a sign. And the sign for this covenant is the rainbow in the sky. He said, this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual 
generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. We as believers and our listeners should be so thankful for these covenant promises that are in Scripture for us, as we're going to see as we go through this today and next week. Mike, the rainbow is perfect. The rainbow has seven colors in it, and a rainbow is formed when light shines through water and the water breaks the light into its many parts. The rainbow is Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Seven is the number of perfection. The covenant of the rainbow is a covenant that was established by God with all living creatures. And I want to say that the rainbow has taken on new meaning. But when we see rainbow in current popular culture, it's not a perfect rainbow. It's a rainbow that doesn't have the colors established by God and it doesn't have seven colors. It has six, which is the number of humanity and the number of imperfection. So God gave us this covenant. God gave us the rainbow, and the rainbow is a sign of his promise to all living creatures. Amen. Well, Laura, let's move into the covenant with Abraham, because that's a very important covenant, obviously. (laughs) That's right, Mike. This is a very important covenant. And really, the covenant with Abraham unfolds before us in three different parts. It unfolds in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. Let's just start reading the covenants, and then we'll talk about those. But Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, Mike, when we see this again, we see a lot of promises made by the Lord and the Lord is binding himself because he's telling Abraham, who is at this point still Abram, a man without any heirs of his own, that he will make him a great nation. And the Lord says in Genesis twelve two, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the Lord makes several promises to Abram, but he promises to bless all. What does all mean? All means all. All means all. He promises to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. Well, Laura, isn't it just like God to be speaking these promises to a man who has, at that point, no offspring? That's right. And, you know, Mike, sometimes we look at our situations and we get discouraged because we hear promises from the Lord but yet we haven't seen those promises fully manifest. But the Lord will often crush the flesh out of us before he is able to bless us. And we see that so many times with people in Scripture. And Abraham is just such a one. From the time that Abraham got the promise at age 75 until the promise was manifested in the birth of Isaac, 25 years had passed, and in that, Abraham made some doozy mistakes, but in the end, he was humble, he was yielded to the Lord, even to the point later on to offer his son Isaac up unto death, the son that he had waited for for 25 years. 
He was willing to do that because he was that sold out and dedicated to the Lord. Wow, Laura, and that's a message to all of us to work towards that type of sacrificial giving to the Lord as we feel led. Yes, we see that. And so many times we see in Scripture that the Lord will not bring the fulfillment of the promises until people are mature enough to handle it. Well, Laura, it gets back to what the Lord has spoken to us in the past about foundations. People are, quote, foundations. They have to be founded in a way that the Lord can build on them. If they have a polluted life going on, he cannot use them. But as they become sanctified and walk closer with the Lord, he can build on them and use them for his kingdom purposes and for his glory. Wow. I just see this so clearly today, right now, that until there is sanctification of the flesh, the promises are not going to come. The answers are not going to come. And we see that with Abraham and how great the call on Abraham's life was. But yet the Lord wouldn't bless him until he was mature enough to handle it. We see that with so many people in Scripture. And the Lord is not bound by time. Twenty-five years the Lord is nothing. But yet Abraham had to wait 25 years to see the fulfillment of the promise with the birth of Isaac. Yes, and one of the great promises of this passage, this covenant agreement of the Lord, is that he's going to bless Abraham, but he is going to bless all of the families of the earth through Abraham. Now, I want to say that if we want to walk in this covenant blessing, it means that we have to bless Israel. We have to bless Abraham's lineage. And that is the condition of us walking in this covenant of blessing. Well, and as you indicated at the beginning of this program, all of these covenants are going to be with Israel, as we will see. We also want to talk about the difference between a covenant and a blessing. So the covenant agreement was with Abraham, and it was for Abraham, his descendants, and through Abraham, all of the families of the earth. But there is a difference between a covenant and a blessing. A blessing is the divine favor of God. And a blessing is one of those things that it's challenging to describe, but you know it when you see it. A blessing is associated with goodwill, happiness, favor, all brought about because of the faithfulness to God and the faithfulness of God. A blessing can also be defined as opposite of a curse. And we see that in Deuteronomy 28, and we've done a program on that not too long ago, the difference between blessings and curses. And so the blessings come because of obedience to the will of the Lord to obey the things that he sets out in his word and to obey the things that he speaks to us directly. Well, that's right, Laura. And I was just thinking about how this covenant is so all-encompassing. And you mentioned it earlier, but I'll point out again in Genesis 12, 3, where God said, And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth. And that's talking about all the families that have been, all the families that are here and now, and all the families to come. It's mind-boggling when you think about the vastness of that covenant. This is a covenant with one man, but the collateral blessings or the third-party beneficiaries could be every family on the earth. And Not only are we talking about Israel, we're also talking about the Gentiles. 
I need to just drop this in here and give this explanation. Every person on the planet is either a Jew or a Gentile. There are two main people groups in God's eyes. The Jews, which is Israel, or the Gentiles, which is everyone else. The nations. So as Christian believers, we are not Jews. We are not born into the lineage of Israel. We come into these covenant blessings through Israel. That's why this is so important for us. And I really believe that's why it's important for the Lord for us to talk about this right now, because Israel has really been so beleaguered and there is a lot of anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish sentiment right now because of the war in Israel. But I want to say that Israel is the apple of God's eye. He loves Israel, and he has said in this passage that he will bless those who bless Israel, and he will curse those who curse Israel. It's really for us to walk in that blessing that God has promised that all the families of the earth will be blessed. It is conditional upon us blessing Israel. Laura, that is so important, and that's why it's so important for our country to support Israel, as well as the people of our country. When I say our country, the United States is where we live. There's such importance, and we see so much turmoil about Israel right now, as you mentioned. We just have to remember that those who bless Israel are blessed and those who curse Israel are cursed, according to Scripture. Mike, exactly. And I do want to finish saying what I was saying about being a Jew or a Gentile, because everybody is either a Jew or a Gentile. And if you're not born into Jewish lineage, you are a Gentile. Most of the Christians that we know are Gentile believers. And so there's another subcategory under each of those headings. Jews, we have Jewish believers in Messiah, Jesus Christ, and Jews who do not think the Messiah has come yet. And in the Gentiles, we have Gentile believers in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Gentiles who do not believe in Jesus Christ. So every person fits into one of those four categories. We're either Jew or Gentile. We either believe in Jesus or we don't. So as Gentile believers, because we are not Jewish, we fit in with a lot of other people, groups who are also Gentiles. Christians that aren't Jewish of origin are Gentiles. We come under these covenant relationships only through Israel. We're going to see that as we go through these next two days. We're going to see that if we want to be blessed under the covenants of God, it is only through Israel that we walk into those blessings. I really wanted us to get finished with the covenant with Abraham before we had to break today, but we're not going to get there. We'll pick up right here next week, and these programs are also available on our website, whereheleadsme.org. If you really want to get the rest of the story, they will be there so you can find out what all the Lord is saying about his covenants with his people. Well, Laura, let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this teaching about covenants that you've put upon our hearts. We thank you for the covenants you have made that we've discussed today and will continue discussing next week. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. For it's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, next week, talking more about covenants. God bless. God bless you. Thank you for listening to this edition of Where He Leads Me with Mike and Laura Harris. To find out more, go to whereheleadsme.org or email Mike and Laura at whereheleadsmeinfo at gmail.com.